Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Maine Department of Education uh, Social Studies hosted virtual learning. Today we uh, are working with the Asher Mav Library. My name is Joe Schmidt. I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the Maine Department of Education, and I'm happy to host Libby Bischoff from USM and the Asher Mav Library, and Renee Kiel from, how close was I? Coyle. Coyle? from uh, the Asher Map Library as well. They're gonna talk about the resources available um, on the website um, and the ways that, again, in these times, uh, how would you approach using that? We've got two educational uh, specialists and experts and they're gonna tell us the best way to approach their materials and use it in your classroom. So Libby, you are a co-host uh, and uh, Renee, you are as well. Um, so if you need any screen share, go ahead with that. And with that, I will monitor the chat room and go from there. Libby and Renee, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm definitely going to turn over the first part of the meeting for as long as possible um, on her end to my educational outreach coordinator, Renee Coyle, who many of you probably know. You can see Renee in row two on the right, sitting with the very adorable Hugh. So uh, as many of you with kids and toddlers at home, you know that sometimes that time is limited. So um, one of the things that would be helpful while we're on the call together, certainly I can screen share, um, but if you wanna go to oshermaps.org on another screen or another window, that is the main site that we're gonna be talking about educational resources on today. So you being on oshermaps.org on your own in addition to any screen shares we do will be uh, very helpful. Um, and Renee, for you, if you want to talk about certain pages, I can go there on a screen share just because you have uh, one hand working at the moment. Okay. Um, it's, my, it's my mouse hand, so we're okay. doing okay. Perfect. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you until okay. you are done. Yeah, <laughs> until he lets us, uh, or as long as he lets us. So, um, yes, we have a whole lot of educational materials online, um, and I'm sure you can imagine we are trying to put as much more as we can going forward on um, because it's going to be pretty difficult, actually impossible to get to classrooms or have classrooms come to us. So um, the very first page I'm going to take you to is um, oshermaps.org um, or slash teach. And I actually um, think that I can do this. Yeah. Does that look right to everyone? Yes. Okay, great. So we have teach here. Um, so I kind of have some quick links at the very top. Um, educational games, those are fun. Um, kind of the downside of these is that it's gonna be pretty difficult um, if, you know, if you don't have a printer or your students don't have a printer to really make these work right now the way they're set up. Um, but we do have some worksheets and activities and these I am going through and trying to um, convert them all into, or as many as I can, into Google Forms. So when you click on them, your students will actually be able to fill them out on their computer or iPad rather than have to print them off. Um, and I only have a few of those done yet, but we'll be trucking through those pretty soon. Um, this is another one. Um, so the other thing I have going on um, is small play. So because the educational games um, are going to be pretty difficult for anyone without access to a printer, this might be a good alternative. We do have our main game here as well. Um, so they can roll the dice, answer the cards, um, and play it that way if they're interested. We also have some other fun games like the scrambler. So this kind of gets them looking at some maps um, a little bit closer to kind of try and unscramble them. Um, and it's, let's see if I can figure out how it works in. Clicked it again, that's right. So we're just going through and trying to figure out what sides match with what. And then geo matching, um, it's actually trying to get them to figure out the shapes of the continents and match them. Um, there's also the Americas. So specific countries, some states. There's some history trivia, so that's another good option to know about. Um, we also have, going back, um, we are still developing learn at home pages. Um, so those pages are 
based on our current lesson themes that we use with students in the classroom or at OSHA Math Library. Um, so what I have here are all of the maps that I use on a regular basis. Um, and you can actually click on the pictures and that will lead you to their item page. And from their item page, students can get in really, really close. So they can actually zoom in. Excuse you. They can actually zoom in. Um, I mean, you can see like how much detail they can get into um, for those. And most of the themes have about um, 12 to 17, I would say is the average in terms of number of maps. And to go along with the maps, there are some activity links that um, you can pick and choose from based on the skill level, skill level of your students. Um, and so for example, one of them is a challenge question sheet, so where they're filling out things that they notice, but then they also have to look at each map very closely to come up with an answer. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's very easy to replicate. So you can go and find your own maps. Um, we have obviously a lot of maps on our website. There's also davidrumsey.com. There's uh, the Leventhal Map Center and loc.gov actually has a lot of maps. So you can come up with a really nice list of maps for your stu students to look at and then you can make your own challenge questions so it's very customizable that way um, there's also scavenger hunt i mean that's a fun thing to kind of get them looking at the maps very closely and you can really um once again tailor this choose choose items that um are going to fit in with your curriculum um, so this is a good way also to sneak some vocab in there um, and make them look for evidence of that vocab on these maps. And um, we also have, you know, some worksheets, like this is a crossword puzzle. Um, we have discussion questions for older students. Um, these are really geared mostly towards high school. Um, and then our primary source analysis tool is really nice because it can actually be used with um, basically any list of maps. Um, so, this is definitely for older students. Um, and what they do first is they're coming up with three observations or questions that should relate to your topic of study. And then they need to pick out the map they liked least, the map they liked most. And then you get into the analysis tool. And this is adapted from loc.gov. Um, and it gets pretty in depth. But what it, it does, um, it really helps, especially if you're um, doing a project or a paper using this a map as a primary source. It really helps you tease out some information that you might not have noticed right off the bat. Um, so it has all of these prompts and you know you can pick and choose which prompts are going to fit for you but it is pretty useful and it's a it's a nice um, tool to practice with especially for um, students who are planning to go off to college soon. Um, so he's starting to get pretty squirrely uh, so why don't I uh, plan on do, do we have any questions on what we've seen so far? Libby is going to take you through our collections and show you how to find your own maps. Um, but in terms of what we've seen. Mm. Sorry, I'm trying to not screen share and I'm having difficult. Oh, stop sharing right there. Hey, I'm back. All right, so yeah, any questions before um, he takes me away? Um, the one of the questions I'm monitoring the chat in the corner and hopefully I am unmuted. Yes. So, um, Gina asks, uh, oh, says one for information. Thank you. Can students just pop onto the website? Absolutely. There is no sign up. All of our resources are free, open to the public. That is our reason for existing. So we don't charge for field trips. Uh, we see about 5,000 K through 12 kids a year in person. And we also come to your classrooms. So when we're all living in that world again, we're, we're happy to help then. But absolutely, if you share any links with your students, if you bring them onto any part of it, it's all free, open, no password, no sign up, no anything. Um, and uh, Lori, the, it's from uh, libraryofcongress.gov. So it's loc.gov. Um, the Library of Congress has a whole host of primary source worksheets and analysis tools. Um, I can call some of those up. The National Archives does as well. Um, 
but that is loc.gov and I can take you to some of those tools in just a second. Um, Great tools on that one. Any more questions specifically for Renee before I let her, uh, <laughs> we welcome her to go and, and hang out with Hugh who got up from his nap. I am happy to uh, drive the rest. Renee, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye everyone. This looks amazing. Okay. So Renee is going to go attend to Hugh and I am here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about more about the educational resources um, kind of piece by piece. And then I wanted to take you through, it's wonderful to use the stuff that we've developed. Um, a lot of it is um, customizable, but I also wanted to spend a little bit of time showing you some of our other resources and how you can use the maps and how if you're conducting Zoom meetings with your students and you wanna do specific map explorations for them for something that you are studying together in your curriculum, that may look a little bit different different than what we're offering. I want you to I want you to be able to know how um, you're doing that yourself. If you could do me a favor, uh, and if you can access the chat, can you just all pop in and tell me what grade you're teaching? Uh, it will allow me to tailor um, my. Thank you. This is great. It will allow me to tailor my comments a little bit. Perfect. We are looking at a lot of elementary, middle, middle grades, sixth, some high school. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. Um, and we'll definitely leave time towards the end um, for you to pop in and, and ask physical face-to-face -face questions that are unique to your classroom um, that I'll be happy to answer for you um, to the best of my ability. Wonderful. Thank you so much for chiming in on that. That's really helpful for me. I will tell you the bulk of the, so we see about 100 plus USM and other college classes a year in addition to 5,000 K through 12 students. So our mission is really education centric. In terms of field trips and visits with K through 12 students, the bulk of what we see is really grade three through grade six. Um, we see also a lot of middle school uh, some high school, high school is very customized and customizable. So a lot of the materials you see on our website for working with your students are going to be there. A lot of them are adaptable nine through 12. Um, but many of them are really geared towards that kind of middle grade, the middle school grades, but also, you know, grades three, four and five, but we certainly have stuff on the website appropriate for kindergartners and first graders, and obviously lots that are, that are also appropriate to high school students uh, and adaptable for learning at home. I can tell you we've had a lot of increased website traffic. We've been sharing our resources for teaching at home quite a bit, and we've had a lot of parents <laughs> going on and, uh, and getting a lot of um, additional resources to share with their kids. Um, so we hope that it will help you um, as well as you go through this. Um, I wanna show you, I'm gonna share my screen um, and I'm gonna go right to uh, oshermaps.org, just our, our homepage. So I'm gonna go there and then I'm gonna share my screen with you. I'm gonna share my desktop, which should work. Can you see me on oshermaps.org? Over here. Okay, here. Do that to me. Let me just have the chat on at the same time. Cool. Oh, and if you are not talking, if you could mute, that would be great. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's no worries. I do it all the time in like every meeting I'm doing. Like everyone heard me teaching my second grader at a big HR meeting the other day. Um, we are all getting used to this. So this is the main page of oshermaps.org and the collections we have um, in person at the library, we have over half a million maps dating back to 1475. Um, maps, atlases, globes, ephemera, games, posters, we have a massive collection of materials. We're really lucky. Um, 
Many of them were donated by the Osher families and the Smith families, but we also actively purchase around curriculum. Um, so if there are maps that we don't have that people are looking for, both at the collegiate level and their K through 12 level, uh, we do have endowment funds to add maps to our collection. And so we're frequently doing that. Um, we are very strong in Maine history and New England history, but we are global in scope. Our oldest map is actually a map of the city of Jerusalem from 1475. Um, so we have, we're really strong in the uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th and 19th centuries. Um, we have a lot more 19th century US material. I'm a historian by trade. I specialize in 19th century US and Maine. Uh, so we've had a lot of 19th century US materials. One of the questions we get all the time is why don't we have as many um, contemporary maps on our website? And the reason for that is copyright. So we have about 60,000 maps fully imaged, digitized, and ready for you to use on the website. And we're going to walk you through how to use them in a second. But you're not going to find a lot of maps from like 2017 or because we can't post them for copyright reasons. We don't own the copyright to that. Whereas all of our older maps, you know, through the 19th and early 20th century, dating all the way back to the 1400s, are not under copyright. And so we can post them and then you can use them freely as well. Um, that's a question we get from students doing research a lot too. Well, I'm interviewing someone and I need a map of, I'm dealing with this right now with a student, I need a map of Mexico from like 2020. I'm like, well, even if I had a map of Mexico from 2020, you could come in and look at it, but I couldn't digitize it and put it on the website. So in case that's a question that you get from students as well. Um, so over in the corner of the website, down where my cursor is, you'll see a button for searching our collections. If you just want to play and you have a keyword, so say I am, um, I want, I'm, I live in Gorham and I want to see if there are any maps from Gorham, Maine. Usually the general keyword search is where I start. I can be a little less specific here. This website, like any other website, prefers you be as specific as possible. And so it's giving me 54 results and it's gonna give me all the results it can come up with in this general search. So this is a great example. So I searched for Gorham and it's giving me a map of Cumberland County, super. I'm gonna click on this map of Cumberland County and it's gonna take me into the individual map itself. So we digitize at 100 megapixels. We have really sophisticated cameras and we digitize to federal uh, guidelines, which very few people in Maine do, but it gives us the ability to have these maps on the web. And so if you look at this bar down here, that will allow you to enter to a full view. I'll just show you what you can do. You can, and it'll just take the internet a couple of seconds to catch up with me you can zoom in super close on these maps. So much so that you can see who's living on particular roads in West Gray, Maine in the 1850s when this map was made. So we have a huge collection of Maine county maps and atlases. Um, these are really fun to do projects with with students. You know, you can find one, especially for your school district. Okay, let's see what art, let's see what Yarmouth looked like. Um, let's see what, you know, Falmouth, let's see what Portland looks like, let's see what Freeport looks like, um, and you can really dive in on these maps. And you can do this, so if you go through the website and you mark, I'll show you the permanent URLs, if you want to do a map exploration with your students as like a warm-up when you're on Zoom, it's a very easy thing um, to be able to do. Um, and so um, one, of the, one of the things you can do with your students is you can kind of drive their exploration when you're together on Zoom, if that's something that you are doing. Another thing, if you're putting together presentations for them, so many of the maps are fully cataloged. So as you scroll down, you'll see notes, data, when it's made, and physical descriptions. 
this link down the bottom is important, this permanent URL. Say you were putting together a lesson for your 10th graders and you were working on the Civil War and you had, we're really strong in the Civil War, I just mentioned that, and you had 10 maps you wanted them to look at, you would give them the permanent URLs and they would click on that and it would take them right to the map. So anytime you click on this, it's gonna take you right to the map that you want them to look at. All of these, if say you're making a PowerPoint or a keynote or something like that, or you just wanna drive, drag a slide into a document that you're putting together, if you click on the download low res image button down here, it will give you this and I'm on a Mac so I can just literally drag and drop it into whatever I want. So that's something your students can do as well. You could send them on a map exploration. You can kind of preset it up for them and you can say, you know, show me what you found and tell me something about the map. So they can just drop it, drop it, drag it onto a desktop and then um, go back to what you were viewing before. Um, and it tells you sort of that you can do that over here. You can also print them. Most people don't print the image record, but you can certainly do that. Um, and then you can also come and see them in person when we're open to the public again, which probably won't be until June at this point. Um, Cindy asks if um, you search and you find a digital image isn't available. Um, does it mean that it's still under copyright or it just hasn't been digitized? Honestly, it could mean both. And yes, you can absolutely request a map be digitized. Uh, when we are here in person and not working remotely, I have two full-time staff members who digitize maps frequently. They are still working on site two days a week because you actually can't digitize maps from home and we're essential ed as educational providers. Um, so yes, I can, and also I have a map of the Berwicks I can pull up in a second. It's a bird's eye view. When you're looking for your town, Sometimes also look for your county and you can get it in the back way. Um, sometimes looking for a town doesn't bring up everything that we have on that particular town. Sometimes you can get at it better by um, county. So yes, you can absolutely request um, a map be digitized. Um, if you find that you need that, I am typing my email into the chat. You're more than welcome to send that request to me and I will forward it to the appropriate person. If people are requesting maps be digitized for purposes other than educational purposes or to like make something with them or make money off them, we charge, but we never charge anyone who's asking the map be digitized for educational purposes and that you wanna use in your classroom. That's true of all of you out there. It's also true of, um, all of the people on the university side that request maps from us. Um, so that's the basic search function. Um, I also wanna show you the one that's a little more in depth. So if you look at advanced search, you're gonna see all of these fields that you can fill in and get much more specific. Title, you can bookend um, when something is published. So you can say, I only want to look at maps between 1880 and 1930. Um, you could pick a particular subject. The other thing is, um, if you're looking through, I just want to point out this on the bottom. Even if you're just doing a basic keyword search and you really don't want to deal with things that we haven't yet digitized, if you tell it, so if I say um, that I want to look at York County, Maine, and I don't care to see anything that's not digitized, I'll tell it to show me only results with images. And then it will only bring up the things that are digitized. And like any search function, it's only as good as the metadata behind it. We are actively working on adding to our metadata every day. In fact, it's our main function while we're working remotely. So the more metadata we put in, the more accurate the searches are going to be. Um, and so I would pull up um, for you, actually, this is a good example of some really neat stuff that we have. 
So this is a map. Notice I searched for York County, but I got Alfred, Maine, which is in York County. This map is actually an argument that the town of Alfred was making that they could host the kind of county seat courthouse based on their population in the 1820s. And so this is an incredible map of Alfred in the 1820s because it shows right after statehood, all of the houses that were built there, who lived there, who owned them, and the size of the house. Um, notice that the majority of the houses are in men's names, um, except for women who were widowed, who were allowed to own property. And so they allow you to do all of these really neat um, kind of searches and explorations. Um, we have the majority of the county atlases in Maine digitized um, that you can go through um, and see the pages with your individual towns in them. Um, I'll show you one of those in a second. But lots of maps in Maine, really great. We have some beautiful Saco Biddeford stuff. Dr. Osher's from Biddeford. So he collected quite a lot of Biddeford maps. We just digitized this. If anyone's uh, studying industrialization, textile factories, we have so many maps of Maine mill towns. And you can really go in and see in very detailed fashion counting rooms, foundries, boarding houses that are being built, where the workers are living, and how these uh, areas change so rapidly. Um, and so they're a good way to explore that as well. The more time you play around searching on the site, the better you'll get at it. Um, if you ever wanted to request something to digitize, the easiest way for us to find maps, here's a really cool pictorial map of York County. The easiest way for us to find maps is by barcode. So if you're looking on this um, and it shows the barcode right here, then we'll know exactly what you're talking about. But here's a great map of York County that shows a lot of the history and you can see that the oldest um, court and records in the United States were here. It takes you through some of the highlights of the history of each town as produced in the 1930s. Um, and so we do a lot of work with students on who's being put on maps, who's being left out of this narrative. Why would you do this and not this? What are indigenous depictions like on maps? We can do really detailed lessons in that, in that sense. Um, and so all of our visits, when you come in and see us, both as K through 12 educators and college educators, we customize each physical visit for you. Um, and we are working on ways, certainly to customize digital visits for you. Um, I'm gonna put Renee's um, email here as well in the chat. I would not hesitate to reach out to Renee for assistance in using these materials in your classroom digitally, um, as well as to schedule field trips for next year, hopefully. Renee has a half-time educational outreach assistant and two student interns who are working with her. So even if she can't answer your question immediately, she can direct it um, accordingly to get you the most up-to-date information on the stuff that, that we have. Um, and so searching through the map sites also works really well. If you look under explore, one of the other resources I wanted to let you know that we have, um, we have a wonderful gallery on campus on site at the OML. We do two shows a year. Um, after each show goes down from the gallery, we put the exhibit up online so you can virtually visit it. This is also a great place to send students. So our most recent exhibit that went down um, just before we closed to the public was called Mapping the Classroom, Teaching Geography and History in 19th and 20th Century New England. I curated it. Um, if you click on the exhibit, it takes you into the introduction, which you can read through. These were the panels that were up. And then down below, you'll find exhibit navigation. And it will take you through each section of the exhibit. And it also includes all of the images from each section, as well as um, all of the entries that were written for each thing that was included in the show. 
So you can virtually visit all of these exhibits. And if you click on the maps, it takes you to the map in our collection that then you can download and read more about the individual website. And so this one just got put up on the web. Um, so you are more than welcome to play around with that one. But just to give you an example, uh, we had a great railroad show. Stately Cartography was an exhibit that was really designed with kids in mind. It's a wonderful, there's a map of each individual state. It has a lot of fun facts and trivia uh, for students. Um, Renee curated this one. And so if you go into um, kind of pictorial state maps or any of the sections, um, you'll notice that she has a fun fact for each state as well as when that state got statehood. So if you're doing um, a lot of United States learning with K through 12 students and want state facts and things as well, um, this exhibit is a great place to have them um, go through. Lori asks me what the title of the exhibit just put up on the website. It's called Mapping the Classroom. Um, and so if you're under Explore Gallery Exhibits, Mapping the Classroom, Teaching Geography and History in 19th and 20th Century New England. Um, so we have dozens of exhibits that are up. Um, there's a great one on World War I that I would recommend for anyone teaching that. We have a massive World War I poster collection. So we have about 120 plus World War I posters uh, fully accessible online on the website. But just showing you under here, you can access a lot of the propaganda posters here. And there's some really great um, links to those and some explanations to those, particularly appropriate for people teaching grades nine through 12 or even late middle school. So I highly recommend spending some time, those are our gallery exhibits. So um, any of the things that were physically up on the walls um, under explore. We also have digital exhibits. These were exhibits that were made um, just for digital purposes. If any of you are teaching fifth grade, we have an annual fifth grade Maine map making contest. So they're not maps of Maine, but any fifth grader in the state can enter. Um, you can see the 2019 map making contest um, top 10. Uh, this was the winner, this beautiful map of York by Margaret L. from Elliot. Um, here are some of the other finalists. Yes, these were all made by fifth graders. They're pretty amazing. Uh, this Casco Bay map is really cool. She did it actually with tissue paper. Um, so we usually have hundreds of entries every year. We've actually been mailing out free map making kits to families with fifth graders who ask us to, who don't have access to supplies right now. We've sent out about 35 or 40 already. We send them the paper, watercolor, colored pencils, um, and uh, an envelope that they can send it back to us in. Um, they're all kinds of maps. They're so creative. Here's one of the Marvel Universe. Uh, here's a lovely one of Mount Desert Island. And we have artists and cartographers and geographers who judge every year. Um, so they're really fun to look at. But all of the details on the map making contest, um, if you have people in your life, even beyond your teaching life, um, is under teach and then map making contest. Tammy, you are asking about the kit. I am showing you hopefully right now. Um, so if you're on teach and you go to the map making contest link um it's got the dates i will tell you right now we will probably extend them uh some important things to know frequently asked questions and right on the bottom there is a google form um oops that they've all been claimed however if you need one we have more um so Tammy, shoot me an email separately and I'll make sure you get one. It means we've sent out 50 already, um, but I have more. So send me an email if you need them. I'm happy to get them out to kids um, with the, with the uh, materials we have left. But we 100% invite people to send those in. 
normally we have a big ceremony for them at the end of May. I mean, I can still hold out hope that that will be happening, but I don't think it will. Um, and we have a professional cartographer who writes books from kids come and do a map uh, workshop where she looks through the maps with all of the 10 finalists there and their families. We are hoping to do a digital version of that workshop this year with the, with the finalists, but I already have all the checks printed out and everything. So there's a $500 grand prize for the winner and then 500 for their classroom and then 250 and 250 and 100 and 100 for the second and third place winners. So that is there and it is definitely happening. Um, for our last bit of time together, I know Joe is gonna jump off and, and get on to, uh, I, will, I will not compromise Angus King's time today. I will hope to jump on that webinar too. I would love to see our Senator. Um, but if anyone has any questions that you want to ask in person, please feel free to unmute and, and do so now. I'm happy to answer anything you might have about your own individual classroom too. Or you can put them in the chat that I can see. One more just kind of fun thing on the website. Uh, is there a way to search for net maps pertaining to Wabanaki studies? This is a great question. So one of the things that I do with students and, and Pam, it depends what grade you're teaching to, to the extent that you'd want to do this. So we work with a lot of classes, um, sixth grade. So this would be an appropriate activity for some for sixth graders as well, certainly modified. One of the things that we do with students when we talk about map making and power and the fact that a lot of the maps that you see of uh, colonial New England are certainly made by the colonizers. Um, I'm gonna show you a good map that you can use with your students um, as I am doing this in, in real time <laughs> uh, and not preloaded. Just give me a second to find the map for you so I can get you to the right thing and talk you through uh, one of the things that we do with students. So I'm looking for the first, um, mm, I put the wrong date in. The first map that was ever made in New England was printed in Boston in the 17th century. Here it is. Um, it's called the Hubbard map. So I am showing you this. So this map was, is a map of New England. It's from 1677, and it was the first printed map that was physically made in the colonies in that the map was carved here out of a wood block. It was printed on colonial printing presses. The other maps are all printed um, either, or either hand done, right? Manuscript maps, one-offs that someone's drawing. Um, but this is the first printed map. So one of the things that we do with students when we talk about the view from the ship and the view from the shore, right? What's the view from the shore, the indigenous peoples who are living here? What's the view from the ship? Most of the maps that are produced are the view from the ship, right? They're the maps of the colonizers. They're the maps of the people who came over. They're the maps of the countries who were claiming these places as their own. And so they're done from that perspective. One of the things we do is that we look at these early maps of New England colonies of Maine, who was part of Massachusetts until 1820. And we look at the ways in which indigenous peoples are depicted on these maps and why people might be depicted in certain ways. Um, so I'm gonna show you on this where you zoom in. So one of the things that the English do is they immediately start renaming things. So on French maps, you'll see a lot of indigenous place names because the French have a very different relationship with the Wabanaki. Based on trade, I'm not absolving the French, they're not great um, either, but their relationships are very different. They learn the language. A lot of this is about um, Catholicism and conversion. They live among the Wabanaki, um, the black robes as they're called, the Jesuits, whereas the English are coming in droves and settling. And so the English are renaming places almost immediately. So even on this, you see very few indigenous place names where if you looked at a French map from the same time period, you'd see almost all indigenous place names. But one of the things we can look at are how indigenous peoples, who you can see over here, 
are being depicted. Um, the English are trying to write out their presence after King Philip's War. And they're doing that with maps by renaming place names and things like that. One of the amazing things that um, the tribes are working on, uh, certainly, Cindy, um, yep, I'm going to uh, show you exactly the thing that you're asking about. Cindy is asking about the place names in Maine are written in, uh, in Wabanaki. So there's two really good resources to that end. Penobscot Nation made a wonderful map that you can purchase that is in both English and Penobscot with the whole map of Maine. It's a huge unfolding map. And then it also has a gazetteer, a little guide that translates into English and Penobscot. Um, there is, that's a physical thing. It might be harder to procure at this time, but I will get that up for you in a second. Um, but I do also want to show you one. And again, this will be me Googling on the fly, so pardon. But um, there is a wonderful map, especially of Western Maine, that was made in conjunction with Passamaquoddy and Penobscot scholars that you can access online. So give me one second to get that up for you and then I can drop the address in into the chat so you can have that on your own screen. Um, if we're thinking of the same one, Libby, I just dropped the link in. Did you? Yes. Let me see if. Yep. Yep. Is this the one that you just dropped in, Joe? Yep. Thank you. So the web version, which I will click on right here, and Joe's link was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you, Joe. Um, you can go on this digital map and you can find the names of the places and you can click on them and then learn where the place name came from, alternate spellings, and where the research is. This is a really fun thing to look at and explore um, with students of all ages. Um, another really wonderful resource, if you haven't um, played around with the resources of the Abbey Museum, the Wabanaki Museum that's up in Bar Harbor, Obviously they're closed now as well, but they have wonderful educators and they're all working remotely. And their educator hub, which I will drop in as well, has some really nice um, language lessons that you can do with kids too. Um, okay. I don't know why it's not letting me drop that in there. Give me one sec. But anyways, here's the educator hub that you can see on the screen. And they have tons of educator resources and lessons. Um, they have some really great animal name lessons for younger grades um, that I'm pulling up here and they have them linked to all the standards and um, all kinds of things that you can do. And then they have some really great recordings where you can see the animals and also you can listen to the name of the animal being spoken as well. So I would definitely spend um, some serious time on the um, Abbey Museum's uh, Educator Hub. Ooh, which it doesn't want me. Joe, if you can drop that thing in there, it won't let me drop in links at the moment. That would be super. Um, the other map um, was made by a group of scholars and we are, thank you, Joe. Um, and we are featuring it in our upcoming bicentennial ex exhibition whenever we open it again. Um, I'm just trying to take you right from where. I think this is the right one. Just give me a second. Oh, 
oh, yep, this is the map. So I'll drop this link in too. But um, Margaret Wickens Purse uh, worked on um, a version of this map. This is coming home to indigenous place names. This is Canada and the Maritimes and the Penobscot Nation also did one together too. Um, and I can send you the link to that. But I know you can purchase it online in Maine Historical Society's store. It's like 20 bucks. I only know because <laughs> we purchased two of them that were getting mounted and hanging in, um, in our show. And the Penobscot um, Nation's Cultural Heritage um, Museum also, they published that, so they have them as well. But the one, the easily accessible one right now is the one um, that Bates did in conjunction with Wabanaki scholars. Joe, I know you probably have a couple of things that you want to say before you get ready for the Angus King webinar. Do you want to jump in? Um, I don't think so. Not specific to this at all. As always, you do a wonderful, wonderful job, especially being so um, responsive to the questions of the group and having resources ready to go at your fingertips. Um, I did drop in the link to your contact hours form and feedback form. Um, I reminded you to make sure that you do your, uh, correctly spell your email and name because that's where it's gonna be sent to and that's what your certificate will say. And then the, the answer to the last question is yes. If you say no, you do not give the certificate and I can't help you at that point. So yes, you did complete the webinar. Can I answer any questions for anybody else while you're at it? As with any resource that's online, the best course of action is spending some time really digging in and, and going through stuff. There's so much out there to sift through. We've really tried. I'm so appreciative of Renee because Renee also works on our website. So I, she dropped all those resources right at the top so people working through this can easily see this. Um, and I really hope that you can get some good use out of it with your students. Please don't hesitate to email us. We are here, we exist for you um, and to use this stuff. And so it makes us glad when you do. And we really, really look forward to the day when we can see everybody in person again. So thanks so much. Good luck with your teaching online. I'm doing the same thing. Nice to see everybody. Last thanks, call. Joe. Any last questions for Libby? I wanna drop in the um, the feedback form just one more time because I know that it gets buried pretty quickly, especially there's so many thank yous in the chat for you, Libby, lots of people loving the presentation and um, sharing their thanks. So helpful, thanks so much. Grateful at the plethora of resources, you're outstanding, fabulous, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of thank yous. We're here for you. Joe, let me know if you need more workshops in the coming weeks. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure we'll think of something. Let me stop the recording here on one end. That'll